Hello. <laughs> okay. I... Who's interested in AI? <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Me too. <laughs> Me three. Okay. So I'm I'm the moderator today. I'm Diane Green, and I'm running Google Cloud and on the Alphabet board. And I. Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce our really amazing guests we have here. I, I also live on this Stanford campus, so I've known one of our guests a long time because she's a neighbor. Um, so let me just introduce them. Uh, first is Fei -Fei, Dr. Fei-Fei Li, and she is the chief scientist for Google Cloud. She also runs the AI lab at Stanford University, the Vision Lab. And then she also uh, founded Sailors, which is now AI for All, which you'll hear about a little bit later. And um, is there anything you want to add to that, Feifei? I'm your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best. And so then uh, the other, um, so now we have Greg Corrado and, uh, Actually, there's one amazing coincidence. Both Fei-Fei and Greg were undergraduate physics majors at Princeton together at the same time. And didn't really know each other that well in the 18-person class. We were, we were like, studying too hard. No, it was, it was kind of surprising to you know, go to undergrad together and then none, neither of us in computer science and then rejoin later, only once we were here. <laughs> All paths lead yeah. to AI and neural networks and so forth. But anyhow, so Greg is a principal scientist in the Google Brain Group. He co-founded it. And more recently, he's been doing a lot of amazing work in health with neural networks and machine learning. He, he has a PhD in neuroscience from Stanford. And so he came into AI in a very interesting way. And maybe he'll talk about the similarities between the brain and what's going on in AI. Would you like to add anything else? Or? No, yeah. sounds good. OK. So I thought, since both of them have been involved in the AI field for a while, and uh, it wasn't, you know, it's recently become a really big deal. But it'd be nice to get a little perspective on the history you know, uh, in yours in vision and yours in neuroscience about um, AI and, and, and how it was so natural to, for it to evolve to where it is now and what you're doing. And start sure. with Fei Fei. I guess I'll start. So, first of all, AI is a very nascent field in the history of science of human civilization. This is a field of only 60 years of age. And it started with a very, very simple but fundamental quest, is can machines think? And we all know thinkers and thought leaders like Alan Turing challenged humanity with that question, can machines think? So about 60 years ago, a group of very uh, pioneering scientists, computer scientists like Marvin Minsky, John McCarthy, started really this field. In fact, John McCarthy, who founded Stanford's AI lab, coined the very word artificial intelligence. So where do we begin to build machines that think? Humanity is best at looking inward and ourselves and try to draw inspiration from who we are. So we started thinking about building machines that resemble human thinking. And when you think about human intelligence, you start thinking about different aspects, the ability to reason, the ability to see, the ability to hear, to speak, to move around, make decisions, manipulate. So AI started from that very core uh, foundational dream 60 years ago, started to proliferate as a field of multiple subfield, which includes robotics, computer vision, natural language processing, speech recognition. And then a very important development happened around the 80s and 90s, which is a sister field called machine learning started to blossom. And that's a field combining statistical learning statistics with computer science. And 
combining the quest of machine intelligence, which is what AI was born out of, with the tools and, and the capabilities of machine learning, AI as a field went through an extremely fruitful, productive, blossoming uh, period of time. And fa fast forward to the second decade of 21st century, the latest machine learning booming that we are observing is called deep learning, which has a deep root in neuroscience, which I'll let you talk about. And uh, so combining deep learning as a powerful statistical machine learning tool with the quest of making machines more intelligent, whether it's to see or is it to um, hear or to speak, we're seeing this blossom. And last, I just want to say three critical factors converged around the, the, the uh, last decade, which is the 2000s and the beginning of 2010s, which are the three computing factors. One is the advance of hardware that enabled more powerful, capable computing. Second is the emergence of big data, powerful data that can drive the statistical learning algorithms. And I was lucky to be involved myself in some of the effort. And then the third one is the advances of machine learning and deep learning algorithms. So this convergence of three major factors brought us the AI boom that we're seeing today. And Google has been investing in all three areas, um, honestly, earlier than the curve. Most of the um, effort started even in early 2000s. And as a company, we're doing a lot of AI work from research to products. Yeah. And it's been, uh, it's been really interesting to watch the divergence and exploration in various academic fields, and then the reconvergence as we see ideas that are aligned. So it wasn't, as Faye says, Faye says it wasn't so long ago that fields like cognitive science, neuroscience, artificial intelligence, even things that we don't talk about much more like cybernetics, were really all aligned in a single discipline. And then they've moved apart from each other and explored these ideas independently for a couple of decades. And then with the renaissance in artificial neural networks and deep learning, we're starting to see some reconvergence. So some of these ideas that were popular only in a small community for a couple of decades are now coming back into the mainstream of what artificial intelligence is, what statistical pattern recognition is, and has really been delightful to see. But it's not just one idea. It's actually multiple ideas that you see that were maintained for a long time in fields like cognitive science that are coming back into the fold. So another example beyond deep learning is actually reinforcement learning. So for the longest time, if you looked at a university catalog of courses and you were looking for any mention of reinforcement learning whatsoever, you were going to find it in a, in a psychology department or a cognitive science department. But today, as we all know, we look at reinforcement learning as a new opportunity, as a, something that we actually look at for the future of AI that might be something that's important to get machines to really learn in completely dynamic environments, in, uh, in environments where they have to explore entirely new stimuli. So I've been really excited to see how this convergence has happened back in the direction from those ideas into mainstream computer science. And I think that there's some hope for exchange back in the other direction. So neuroscientists and cognitive scientists today are starting to ask whether we can take the kind of computer vision models uh, that, that Fei Fei helped pioneer and use those as hypotheses for how it is that neural systems actually compute, how our own biological brains see. Um, and I think that that's a really, it's really exciting to see this kind of exchange between uh, disciplines that have been uh, separated for a little while. 
you know, one little piece of history I think that's also interesting is what you did, Feifei, -Fei, with ImageNet, which is a nice way of expl explaining, you know, um, building these neural networks where you labeled all these images and then people could refine their algorithms by... Go ahead and explain that just real quickly. Okay, sure. So, um, about 10 years ago, that the whole community of computer vision, which is a subfield of AI, was working on a holy grail quest, uh, problem of object recognition, which is you open your eye, you can see the world full of objects like flowers, chairs, people, you know, um, and that's a building block of visual intelligence and intelligence in general. And to crack that problem, we were building as a field different machine learning models we're making small progress, but we're hitting a lot of walls. And uh, when my student and I started working in this problem and started thinking deeply about what is missing in the way we're approaching this problem, we recognized this important interplay between data and statistical machine learning models. They really reinforce each other in very deep mathematical ways that we're not gonna talk about the details here. And that realization was also inspired by human vision. If you look at how children learn, it's a lot of learning through big data experiences and exploration. So combining that, we decided to put together a pretty um, epic effort of we wanted to label all the images we can get on the internet. And of course, we Google searched a lot. And we downloaded billions of images and used crowdsourcing technology to label all the images, organize them into a data set of 15 million images uh, in, um, organized in um, 22,000 categories of objects and put that to, uh, together and that's the ImageNet project. And we democratized it to the research world and released it open source. And then we, starting 2010, we um, held an international challenge for the whole AI community called ImageNet Challenge. And one of the teams from Toronto, which is now at Google, um, won the ImageNet Challenge yeah, yeah. with the uh, deep learning convolutional neural network model. Mm -hmm. And that was year 2012. And a lot yeah. of people think the combination of ImageNet and the, the deep learning model in 2012 was the onset of what we Greg gave is people doing. a way to compare how they were doing. Exactly. And it was really yeah. good. So yeah. And so Greg, you've been doing a lot of uh, brain-inspired research, very interesting research, and, and I know you've been doing a lot of very impactful research in the health area. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the, the ImageNet example actually sort of sets a playbook for how we can try to approach a problem. Um, the kind of machine learning uh, and AI that is most practical and most useful today is ones where machines learn through imitation. It's an imitation game where if you have examples of a task being performed correctly, the machine can learn to imitate this. And this is called supervised learning. And so what happened in the image recognition case is that by, by Feifei building an object recognition data set, we could all focus on that problem in a really concrete tractable way in order to compare different methods. And it turned out that uh, methods like deep learning and artificial neural networks were able to do something really interesting in that space that previous machine learning and artificial, um, uh, artificial intelligence methods had not, which was that they were able to go directly from the data to the predictions and break the problem up into many smaller steps without having be being told exactly how to do that. So that's what we were doing before, is that we were trying to engineer features or cues, things that we could see in the stimuli that then we would do a little bit of statistical learning on to figure out how to combine these signals. But with artificial neural networks and deep learning, we're actually learning to do those things all together. And this applies not only to computer vision, but it applies to most things 
that you can imagine a machine imitating. And so <laughs> the kinds of things that we've done, like with, um, with Google Smart Reply and now Smart Compose, we're taking that same approach, that if you have a lot of text data, which it turns out the internet is full of, what you can actually do is you can look at uh, the sequence of words so far in a conversation or in, in, um, a, uh, in an email exchange and try to guess what comes next. You know, and, you know I'm going to interrupt here a little bit and um, get a little more provocative here. All right. So you're talking about uh, you know, neural-inspired machine learning and so forth. And uh, so, you know, this artificial intelligence is kind of bringing into question what are we humans, and then there's this thing out there called artificial general, AGI, artificial general intelligence. What do you think's going on here? Are we getting to AGI? I really don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, there's a variety of opinions in the community, but my feeling is that okay, we've finally gotten artificial neural networks to be able to recognize photos of cats, right? That's really great. <laughs> um, uh, we, we also, it's now can... Uh, Fei, you know, Fei was that AGI when we recognized a cat? No, <laughs> that's not enough yeah. to define AGI. So the kind of thing that's working well right now is this sort of pattern recognition, this immediate response where we're able to recognize something kind of reflexively. And we now have, I believe, machines can do pattern recognition every bit as well as humans can. And that's why they can recognize objects in photos, that's why they can do speech recognition, and that's why they can win at a game like Go. But that is only one small sliver, a tiny sliver, of what goes into something like intelligence. Uh, notions of memory and planning and strategy and contingencies, even emotional intelligence. These are things that are, have just, we haven't even scratched the surface. And so to me, I feel like it's really a leap too far to imagine that having finally cracked pat pattern recognition after some, some decades of trying, that we are therefore on the verge of cracking all of these other problems that go into what constitutes general intelligence. Although we have gone way faster than either of you ever expected us to go, I believe. Um, yes and no. H humanity has a tendency to, un um, to, to overestimate uh, short-term progress and underestimate long-term progress. So eventually we will be achieving things that we cannot dream of. But Diane and Greg, I want to just give a simple example to define AGI. So, <laughs> The definition of AGI, again, is an introspective definition of what humans and human intelligence can do. I have a two-year-old daughter who doesn't like napping. And uh, I, I thought I'm smart enough to scheme to put her in a very complicated sleeping bag that doesn't get herself out of the crib. <laughs> and uh, just a couple of months ago, I was on the monitor watching this kid, two-year-old, where for the first time, she, I was training her for napping for, by herself. She was very angry. So she looked around, figured out a weak spot on the crib where she might be able to climb out, figured out how to unzip her complicated sleeping bag that I thought I schemed to do really, you know, uh, to, to, to prevent that, and figured out a way to climb out of a crib that's way taller than who she is and managed to escape safely and, um, and <laughs> without breaking well, okay, her legs. Okay, okay. How about AGI equivalent to my cat or equivalent to, my, to a mouse? If you're shifting the definition, sure. <laughs> I see. Okay. <laughs> but even cat, I think there are things that the cat is capable yeah. of doing. That, so, uh, so I do think that if you, if you look at an organism like a cat, from a behavioral level, like the, what, how cats behave and how they respond to their environments. I think that you could imagine a world where you have something like a, a toy that you know, is for entertainment purposes that approximates a cat in a bunch of ways in that the sorts of behaviors that the human observe, you're like, oh, it walks around, it doesn't bump into things, it meows at me every once in a while. I do believe that we can build a system like that. But what you can't do is you can't take that robot and then you know, uh, dump it in the forest and have it figure out 
what it needs to do in order to, to, to survive and make okay. things work. Okay. But, but it's a goal. It's a healthy goal. To, it's a to, healthy goal. And, and along the way, like, you both, at least we all three agree that AI's capacity to help us solve all our big problems is going to outweigh any kind of negative, and we're pretty excited about that, I guess. Like, like in cloud, you're kind of doing some cool things with AutoML and so forth. Yeah, so um, we talk a lot, Diane, about the belief of building benevolent technology for human use, right? Our technology reflect our values. So I personally, and I know Greg's whole team is working on um, bringing AI to the to people and to the fields that really need it to make a positive, uh, positive difference. So at Cloud, we're very lucky to be working with customers and partners from all kinds of vertical industries, from healthcare where we collaborate, to agriculture, to sustainability, to um, entertainment, to, to retail, to commerce, to finance, where our customers bring some of the toughest problems and their pain points, and we can work with them hand in hand to solve some of that. So for example, uh, recently we rolled out AutoML, and that is the recognition of the pain of entering machine learning. It's still a highly technical field, the bar is still high. Not, not enough people are trained experts in the world of machine learning. But yet, our industry already has so, many, so much need to you know, tag pictures, understand imageries, just as an example in vision. So how do we answer that call of need? So we worked hard and thought about uh, this, this suite of pro uh, product called AutoML, where the customer, we lower the entry barrier by relieving them from coding machine learning custom models themselves. All they have to do is to give us the kind of, provide the kind of data and concept they need. Here's an example of a ramen company in Tokyo yeah. that has many shops of uh, ramens, and they want to build an app that recognizes the ramens from different uh, ramen stores. And they give us the pictures of ramens and the concepts of their store one, store two, store three. And what we do is to use a technique, a machine learning technique that Google and many others have developed called learning to learn, and then um, build a customized model for the customer that recognize ramens for their different stores. And then the customer can take that model to do what they want. You know, I can write a little C++, maybe some JavaScript. Could I do AutoML? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. We're working with teams that uh, they don't have not even C++ experience. And the, we have a drag and drop interface, and, uh, and, and, and you can use AutoML that way. Because I really believe that you know there are so many problems that can be solved using this technique that it's it's critical that that we share as much as possible about how these things work. I don't believe that these technologies should live in walled gardens, but instead we should develop tools that can be used by everyone in the community, and that's part of why we have a very aggressive open source stance to uh, our software packages, particularly uh, in in AI. Um, and that includes things like TensorFlow that are available completely freely, and it includes the kinds of services that are available on cloud to do the kind of compute storage and model tuning and serving that you need to use these things in practice. And I think it's amazing that we, the same tools that my applied machine learning team uses to, to tackle problems that we're interested in, those same tools are accessible to all of you as well to try to solve the same problems in the same way. And um, I've been really excited with how, how much it's, uh, how great the uptake is and how we're seeing expanding to other languages. Uh, mentioning JavaScript, quick plug for tensorflow.js is actually really <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yep. Oh, and you should probably run it on a TPU. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, 
uh, it does give a nice boost. But um, so, so you're doing, you're building, I mean, with machine learning, we're bringing it to market in so many ways because we do, we have the, the tools to build your own models, the TensorFlow, we have the auto ML that brings it to any programmer. And then what's going on with all the APIs and, and how is that going to affect every industry and what do you see going on there? So cloud uh, already um, has a suite of APIs for a lot of our industry partners and customers from translate to speech to vision to... Um, which are based on models that we built. Yes, we yeah. can build, uh, for Entry. example, Box is a major partner with uh, Google Cloud mm -hmm. where uh, they recognize a tremendous need for organizing uh, customers' uh, imagery data to help customers. So they actually use Google's Vision API to yeah. do that. And, yeah. uh, and that's a, a, a model easily delivered to our customers through, through our uh, service. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. I mean, Greg, how do you think that's going to uh, play out in the health industry? I know you've been yeah. thinking about yeah, that. Yeah. So, it, so healthcare is one of the problems that a bunch of people are working on at Google and a lot of people are working on outside as well because I think there's a huge opportunity to use these technologies to expand the availability and the accuracy of healthcare. And part of that is because there's, um, there's uh, doctors today are basically trying to weather an information hurricane in order to provide care. And so there's... There are, I think there are thousands of individual opportunities to make doctors work more fluid, to build tools to solve problems that they want solved, and to do things that help, um, that help patients and improve patient care. I mean, but I think I, you're, you, you were telling me that so many doctors are so unhappy because they have so much drudgery to do. Is this, is this a big... Breakthrough? Yeah, or? absolutely. I mean, I, I believe that there's a there's been a great um, you know when you go to a doctor, you're you're looking for medical attention, right? And right now, a huge amount of their attention is not actually focused on the practice of medicine, but is focused on a whole bunch of other work that they have to do that that doesn't require the kind of uh, insights and care and connection the real practice of medicine does. And so I believe that machine learning and, and AI is going to come into healthcare uh, through assistive technologies that help, help the doctors do, do what they want to do better. By understanding what they do in a system. No substitute for the human. No, the I humans. don't think so. <laughs> yeah. No substitute. Speaking of human, uh, Feifei, do you want to talk a little bit about why um, you've been so you think this humanistic AI approach is so critical? Yeah, thank you. So if we look at the history of AI, we've entered phase two. The first 60 years is AI as more or less a niche technical field where we're still laying down scientific foundations. But starting this point on, AI is one of the biggest drivers of societal changes to come. So. How do we think about AI in its next phase? What is the frame of mind that should be driving us has been on top of my mind. And I think deeply about the need for human-centered AI, which, in my opinion, uh, includes three elements to complete the human-centered AI uh, thinking. The first element is really advancing AI to the next stage, and here we bring our collective uh, background from neuroscience, cognitive science, you know, whether we're getting to AGI tomorrow or, or, or in 50 years, there's a need for AI to be a lot more uh, flexible, nuanced, uh, learn faster in more um, unsupervised, semi-supervised, uh, uh, one-shot learning ways uh, to be able to understand emotion, to be able to communicate with humans, so that is the more human-centered way of advancing AI science. The second part is the human-centered AI technology and application, is that I love what you're saying, that there's no substitute for humans. This technology, like all technology, is to enhance humans, to augment humans, not to replace humans. We'll replace certain tasks, 
will replace humans out of danger or our tasks that we cannot perform. But the bottom line is we can use AI to help our doctors, to help our disaster relief workers, to help decision makers. So there is a lot of technology in robotics, in design, in natural language processing that is centered around human-centered AI technology and application. The third element of human-centered AI is really to combine the thinking of AI as a technology as well as the societal impact. We are so nascent in seeing the impact of this technology, but already, like Diane said, that we are seeing the impact in different ways, ways that we might not even predict. So I think it's really important and it's a responsibility of everyone from academia to industry to government to bring social scientists, philosophers, law scholars, policy makers, ethicists, and, and historians at the table and to study more deeply about AI's social and humanistic impact. And that is the uh, three elements of human-centered AI. That's, that's pretty wonderful. And, and I think we at Google here, Alphabet, are working as hard as we can to do humanistic AI. Um, you know, you mentioned, a, um, you know, what we need to be careful about out there with AI and regulatory. What are some of the barriers to, you know, I think every company in the world has a use for AI in many, many ways. I mean, it's just exploding in all the verticals. But there are some impediments to adoption, for example, in financial, the financial industry, they need to have something called explainable AI. And could you just talk about some of the different barriers you see to being able to take advantage of AI? We should start yeah. with healthcare. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I think that there are, there are a bunch of really important things to consider. So one of the things is, uh, of course, we want to um, uh, have, have machine learning systems that are designed to fit the needs uh, of the folks that are using them and applying them. And that can often include not just giving me the answer, but telling me something about how that was um, derived. So some kind of explainability. So in the healthcare space, for example, um, we've been working on a bunch of things in medical imaging, and it's not acceptable to just tell the doctor that, oh, you know, something looks fishy in this x-ray or this pathology slide or this retinal scan. You have to tell them, you know, well, what do you think is wrong? But more importantly, you actually have to show them where in the image you think the evidence for that conclusion lies so that they can then look at it and decide whether they concur or they disagree or, oh, well, there's a speck of dust there and that's what the machine is picking up on. And the good news is that these things actually are possible. And uh, there, I think there's kind of been this unfortunate uh, mythology that AI and deep learning in particular is a, is a black box. And it really isn't. Um, uh, we didn't study how it worked because for a long time it really didn't work that well. But now that it's working well, there are a lot of tools and techniques that go into examining how these systems work. And I think explainability is a big part of it um, in, in terms of making these things uh, available for a bunch of applications. So I, in addition to explainability, I would add bias. Um, I think bias is an issue we need to address in AI. And I see bias from where I said two major kind of bias we need to address. One is the pipeline of AI development, starting from the bias of the data to the outcome of the bias. And we have here a lot, uh, heard a lot about if the machine learning algorithm is fed with data that does not represent the, 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 the problem domain in a fair way, we will introduce bias. Uh, whether it's uh, missing a group of people's data or, or uh, biasing it to a skewed distribution, um, these this are things that would have deep consequences, whether you're in the healthcare domain or finance or legal decision making. So I think that is a huge issue. Uh, very nicely that Google is already addressing that. We have a whole team at Google working on bias yeah, in, in this. That's true. And, and another bias I think it's important is 
the people who are developing AI, it's the human yeah. bias. And, and the lack of diversity is also another it's bias. It's so important, and that kind of brings me to maybe our, some of our, we're getting close to the end, but um, if you, uh, you know, where is AI going? I mean, how prevalent is it going to be? I mean, we look at our universities and these machine learning classes have 800 people, 900 people. You know, there is such a demand. Every computer science graduate wants to know it. Where is it going? I mean, will every high school graduating senior be able to customize AI to their own purposes? Um, and, and how will, you know, how, what, what does it look like five, ten years from now? So from a technology point of view, I think that there, because of the tremendous investment in resource, both in the private sector as well as in the public sector now, every, many countries are waking up to uh, invest in AI, we are going to see a huge continue um, development of AI technology. I'm mostly excited uh, either at cloud or seeing what Greg's team is doing, AI being delivered to the industries that really matter to people's lives and uh, work uh, quality and productivity. But Diane, I think you're also asking is, um, how are we educating more people in AI, right? So both making it easier to use and educating them, and, and what's it going to look like? I, you know, what do you predict? So, that's a really tough question because at the core of today's AI is still calculus, and that's not going to change. <laughs> so, so I, th I think that from the kind of from the the tech uh, the tech industry perspective or from the computer science education perspective, I think that we're going to see AI and ML become as essential as networking is, right? Like, no one really thinks about, oh, well, I'm going to write some software and it's going to be standalone on a box and it's not going to have a TCPI connection, right? Like, we all know that you're going to have a TCPI connection at the end of the day somewhere. And everyone understands the basics of the networking stack. And, and that's not just at the engineering of the level of engineers, that's at the level of designers, of, of, of executives, of, um, uh, of product developers and leaders. And the th same thing I think is going to happen with machine learning and AI, which is that designers are going to start to understand how can I make a, a completely revolutionary kind of product that folds in machine learning the same way that we fold in networking and internet technologies into almost everything we build. So I think we're going to see tremendous uptake and it becoming kind of a pervasive background part of the technologies. But I think that in that process, the ways that we use AI are going to evolve. So I think right now, you're seeing a lot of things where AI and machine learning add some, some spice, some extra little coolness on a feature. And I think that what you're going to see um, over the next decade is you're going to see more of a core integration into what it means for the product to actually work. And I think that one of the great opportunities there is actually going to be the development of artificial emotional intelligence that allows products to actually have much more natural and much more fluid human interaction. We're beginning to see that in the assistant now with speech recognition, speech synthesis, understanding dialogues and exchanges. But I think that this is still in its, in its infancy. We're going to get to a point where uh, the products that we build, they interact with humans in the way that the humans find most useful, just out of the box. And I spend a lot of time with high schoolers, because I really believe in the future. You know, we always talk about AI changing the world. And I always say, the question is, who is changing AI? And to me, bringing more human mission thinking into technology development and thought leadership is really important. Not only important for the future of our technology and the value we instill in our technology, but also in bringing the diverse group of students and future leaders into the development of AI. So, you know, at Sever at Google, we all work um, a lot on this issue, and personally, I'm very involved with AI for All, which is a nonprofit that educates uh, high schoolers around the country from diverse backgrounds, whether they're 
uh, girls or, or students of underrepresented uh, minority groups, and we bring them onto AI, in, onto campus, university campus, and uh, work with them on um, AI thinking and yeah. AI studies. And, and at Google, we're just completely committed to bringing all our best technologies to everybody in the world, and we're doing that through the cloud, and we're bringing these tools, we're bringing these APIs, and the training, and the partnering, and the processors, and we're pretty excited to see what all you guys are gonna do with it. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. everybody.